Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today we have a sponsored stream. Shout out to Adam for sponsoring today's stream. We discussed a few different topics and he settled on a discussion regarding democracy, something that is obviously quite prominent in our daily lives here in the United States, but really all the Western world. And we're going to be doing a historical overview, looking at democracy, but more specifically, just comparing ancient Athens, the founding place of democracy and the American situation, because really it's American democracy or representative democracy or indirect democracy, which is different than that of the Athens, which is sort of colored much of the Western world. So all the other various forms of democracy are in some way a form of representative democracy. So instead of covering all the other forms in the world, we're really going to be focusing on Athens and America today. And we have a lot to get through. Um, so before we begin, I am no expert on ancient Athens in the golden era of democracy that lasted for about 200 years. So there was this golden period in which they had a very direct form of democracy, and, and we're going to get over go over all the details regarding this, in which they believed free men that are Greek, specifically Athenian, would be able to take control over their rep or their government. So I have a, def a working definition here for democracy today, because what is democracy? It's where the people living under political institutions, exercise control over them. And so I also have a list of criticisms regarding democracy, because as you guys know, and I kind of teased it in the video title here, mob rule, is that there are some negative downsides potentially to democracy. And the mob rule would be much more indicative of the Athenian context. However, because of the homogeneity in which the voters and representatives of their democratic rule, it allowed for a little bit more um, efficiency, so to speak. So when we start getting into the modern day states and looking at democracy at scale and democracy in regards to heterogeneous populations, 
um, it's a little bit of a different context. And interestingly, too, we don't have a long term historical example of democracy. Really, the longest one that we have is America right now. And we're going to highlight how is it truly a democracy? Is it not? Are we becoming more democratic? Are we becoming less democratic? We're going to answer all these questions today. But, um, you know, when we look at some of the longest empires throughout history, they're typically monarchical. And obviously, many people watching today's stream um, are probably Orthodox Christians and understand that the Orthodox Church has had an interesting relationship in its promotion of monarchy and the symphonia between the church and the state. And so that is indicative of the double-headed eagle, of course. And so the eagle has two heads. It's the church that informs the empire, that informs the emperor, that, that informs the sort of political sphere and the public sphere. And so secularism obviously does away with God, and that's part of the Enlightenment ideals of liberty, fraternity, and equality. Um, and America is going to be indicative of that because when we start looking at the wishes for democracy in the American context, we're going to see this push for equality. And in some ways, we can agree with this. Um, and also liberty. And they're trying to resist authoritarianism, uh, other structures like feudalism. And how exactly do you give more rights and more power to the people? This is what the founding fathers were trying to do. But unlike the Athenians, the American Revolution and the American democracy is much more informed by Rome, too. So that's an important part that we'll discuss as well, is that um, actually, despite the democratic ideals, and we're going to talk about how many of the founding fathers used republicanism and dem democracy interchangeably, even though technically they are different, um, but they do ultimately mean the same thing. The demos is the people. So rule by the people is what democracy means. And res publica in Latin is another sort of rule by the people, which is a Republican form. So the, in the American context, they really looked back to ancient Rome and sort of a compatibilistic synergy between the sort of democratic ideals of Athens but really a sort of Republican representative system here in the United States. So we're going to be covering that. Then we're going to get into the problems. And I got videos both um, talking a little bit about, about Athenian democracy as well as the American form. So smash that like, guys. Really appreciate you all being here on this Thursday. I don't know what was going on with the intro. I don't know why the video is not working, but that is part and parcel of my day to day. Seems like everything uh, God, you know, God willing, this stream doesn't, but everything's kind of been falling apart and going wrong. And so many things have been coming up. So that's been kind of my luck today. So smash that like. I really appreciate all you guys being here. And if you have any questions or comments, you'd like to support the stream, please do so with a super chat on Streamlabs or Dono chat. Or if you prefer the YouTube, uh, feel free to use YouTube, uh, sending in a super chat or gifting some memberships. If we have any nubs out there, uh, getting a little bit of a nub wave going, gifting some memberships. I know everybody in the chat really appreciates that. And before we get going, just take care of a little bit of housekeeping. And so if you would like to support my work, one of the best things you can do is go over to the website and become a website member. We got three different memberships. We just had a think tank meeting last night, which was great. We talked a lot about Orthodox prophecies and the Great World War. So I don't know if you guys have been following Metropolitan Neophytos of Morphu, and he is kind of the emblematic figure within the Orthodox Church, um, looking at many of the modern day prophecies by recent saints and giving context to look at geopolitics right now. And so he had some recent uh comments concerning Iran and Israel and obviously Russia and Turkey and how all this relates to our Orthodox faith. So we were talking a lot about that last night in our think tank meeting. So if that's something you guys would be interested, go to the website, become a premium member. Um, also, we have videos that are exclusive behind a paywall for the basic membership of $5 a month. So if you'd like to get access to videos talking about uh, topics that maybe are a little bit more contentious, um, 
for the YouTube interwaves. That's all at the website for members. So check that out. Also, if anybody would be interested in setting up a one-on-one -on -one session, uh, we can get into a private Zoom meeting and talk about anything your heart desires. You can sign up right here. Would greatly appreciate that as well. That's a great way to support and also provide value. We can get into philosophy, world history, uh, religion, uh, whatever topic that your heart desires, we can do so in that. And then also, again, a major thank you to Adam for sponsoring today's stream on democracy and a historical overview. If you also would like to sponsor a stream of which those are going to be the majority of my streams for the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be focusing, I'm going to be focusing highly on the sponsored stream. So if you have a great video topic you'd like me to dive into and perform research on, uh, go to the website, purchase a sponsored stream, and then I will reach out to you and we can talk in a little bit of details about what topic your heart desires and what exactly you would like to cover. Also, if you are in the market for some Orthodox merchandise, make sure to go to orthodoxdepot.com, orthodoxdepot.com, use promo code CODEL, C-O-T-E-L, Church of the Eternal Logos. You'll get 10% off all products and it's a great way to support me as well as a good Orthodox company right here in the Midwest, orthodoxdepot.com. They sell icons, incense, prayer ropes, anything that your heart desires. Maybe they have what you're looking for. Go over there, check it out, and then use promo code CODE to be able to help me out as well as an Orthodox company. So check that out if you guys are interested. Okay, so to introduce today's topic, because we have a lot of details that maybe get a little bit monotonous as we go through, we're going to actually begin with some videos. And I finally found some videos touching on today's topic that are available to the public that I can use in this live stream. So we're going to watch a video on to begin on the creation of Athenian democracy, um, how they utilize different symbols, and then how voting worked. And then I'm going to go into more details about what Athenian democracy is, why it was unique and novel at that point in history, how it fell apart, and how this is going to relate to the American context. And then I got multiple points to move through because there's going to be so many interesting insights actually in today's stream. When we look at democracy in America and how really many of the people that are screeching about democracy right now and, and that democracy is going away are actually promoting many of uh, the contrary ideals to the founding of democracy. Now, as I said, we're Orthodox Christians, and I was even sort of the target of a hit piece by Sarah Riccardi Schwartz because there is a... Um, narrative out there that some of us ortho bros or these orthodox online content creators are anti-democracy and we are a threat. Uh, they labeled us as, uh, well, every pejorative term you can imagine, right? Uh, so I actually covered that a while back. I think that was last summer when that hit piece came out. So um, this is a very contentious topic. And if you lay criticism to democracy, well, then you are essentially, uh, in some people's eyes, a domestic terrorist. So at the same point, uh, democracy is built upon free speech. And this is going to be something that we're going to see is true both for the Athenian context and the American context. And as we know, even right here on YouTube, we have to be careful what we say because censorship is on the rise. And so can you really have a democracy in light of censorship, of free speech? I think the ultimate answer is no, you can't. Um, so we have to be careful. At least I have to be somewhat careful of what we say today, but over on the stream for members, I've already done a video on Christian monarchy because whether we look at the Byzantine empire or even the Holy Roman empire, we see that monarchy is typically promoted in a Christian context. And, uh, there is no references obviously to Republican or Republicanism or democracy in the Bible. And so shout out to Jay Dyer. He actually shared an article that I covered before on On Christian Monarchy by Dean Arnold. And he makes four interesting points of why the Bible does pr promote monarchy. But as we know, too, as Orthodox Christians, um, we're not going to be moving back. So the idea that a, mon a monarchy is ever going to occur 
in the United States is highly unlikely or anywhere really in these Western nation states. So we have to deal with what we have. And today is really about educating what democracy is, how it came about, how it's supposed to function, what are the um, inherent ideals that are necessary for it to function correctly, and are those things still in place in our contemporary society? So I think by the end of today's stream, it's going to give you a lot of ammo to actually look at America in 2024 and see, are we becoming more democratic or are we becoming less democratic? So that's what's on store today. Uh, let's begin, as I said, with some videos kind of introducing Athens and Athenian democracy, because as I'm sure you guys, as myself, I wasn't real familiar with it. I was obviously familiar with Athens being the birthplace of democracy, but getting into uh, Solon and some of the uh, the reformations that occurred, the three sort of reforms that occurred uh, to really give rise to the golden age of Athenian democracy, I wasn't too familiar with. And I'm sure people out there watching this stream are probably going to know more about that than I do because I just spent, um, you know, the, the a couple days really diving into this topic and diving into this research. So the goal is really to introduce all this stuff to you. So if you are um, savvy out there on these topics, I am no expert on ancient Athenian democracy or even uh, American political science, but I think we're going to be able to get around this topic. So um like I said, let's do, let's begin with a video introducing Athenian democracy, the road to Athenian democracy. We got three videos. We're going to be looking at their utilization of symbols, symbolism, and why symbolism was so important to Athenian democracy, and then how voting worked. And then I want to begin to, uh, to sort of go through in a detailed format what their democracy was and how it worked. And then we're going to look and compare the American and the Athenian forms. So let's begin there. All right. Turn this on. Okay. All right. Let's check out this video. The ancient Athenians are famous for inventing democracy, but it didn't happen overnight. In fact, it took years of experimentation with other forms of government before they got it just right. When Athens was founded sometime around the 9th century BCE, it was a monarchy ruled over by powerful kings. The rule of one, as it was known, had been in place for over 800 years. When a power grab by wealthy nobles ushered in a new system of government, the rule of the few. Under this system, known as an oligarchy, laws were created by and for the elite. It meant that average Athenians had no say in how their city was run. This inevitably led to civil unrest and inspired this guy, Draco the Lawgiver, to create the city's first written law code designed to protect the interests of the people. Unfortunately, the penalty for breaking many of Draco's laws was death, which some deemed too harsh. So another legislator called Solon composed a fairer system, which distributed political power based on property. So again, notice canceling of debts. This was huge because as we'll talk about in the Athenian context, before Solon's reforms here, um, much of the Athenian populace was actually indebted to a small group of individuals. Again, is that indicative of our current situation? I'll ask you guys, and you can come to your own conclusions, obviously so. And they believe that a populace that was in debt was impossible to be free. Now, you look at student loans and you look at the way that America and the central banks are operating, it seems like their goal is essentially to put us all into debt and enslave us through the monetary system. So canceling debts was Solon's first reform, repeal of draconian punishments, redistribute political power, and the lay foundations of democracy. And I'm going to speak a little bit more to Solon and really the... Like I said, the only people that were allowed to vote within Athenian democracy were free male Greeks. And that really only composed, uh, what we looking at estimates, was somewhere around 10 to 20 percent of the populace. And in the Athenian context, it was essentially mob rule. However, it worked for them, and we'll 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 discuss a little bit about why the few and the aristocrats and the Greek nobles were very much against the idea of democracy. But the assembly, the the ecclesis, uh, they were 
had extraordinary power, but it was limited. And so slaves, uh, non-Greeks, barbarians, and women were not to participate in the democratic structures at that time. Pretty ownership. But then a Greek general, Pisistratus, seized power and declared himself the tyrant of Athens. Tyranny is a form of government in which one individual holds absolute power. It sounds cruel, but Pisistratus was actually quite popular because he invested in public works that made people's lives better. Power struggles continued between tyrants for years until an uprising swept statesman Cleisthenes to power. His legal and political reforms weakened the traditional aristocracy and gave some powers back to the people, heralding a new era of democratic government. Why do you think democracy survived and thrived in Athens for hundreds of years? And so the fall of Athenian democracy, as I'm going to reiterate multiple times, is, is typically the date of 321. And this has to do with Macedonia conquering Athens and, and many of the uh, Greek states because uh, it was it was constructed. Ancient Greece at that time was structured around city states. And so when Macedon became so militarily powerful that they basically uh, ruled, this was the end of this golden age of Athenian democracy. Now. I want to watch. We're going to watch two more videos here, just introducing these concepts, because as I move through, I want some of the things to be familiar. And if we get too deeply into the weeds of the details, I think it might be a little bit confusing. So here is one on democratic symbols in ancient Athens. And then we're going to look at how voting worked. And then I'm going to get into more ex explicit details. Symbols are all around us. From road signs to emojis, they're powerful because they convey complex meanings without using words. And in democracies, fundamental ideals like liberty and justice have been represented by symbols for centuries. When democracy emerged in ancient Athens in the 5th century BCE, Athenians used symbols to communicate their thoughts and ideas. For example, they would often carve a figure known as demos into stone reliefs to represent the people of the city. Democracy and religion were closely linked, and the image of a temple came to symbolize both. Drawing on Egyptian and Persian culture, the Greeks created imposing temples with colorful columns and detailed sculptures. One of the most famous Athenian temples, the Parthenon, was dedicated to Athena, the goddess of wisdom and war. She was often represented by an owl or olive tree, while the image of Themis, the Greek goddess of law and order, represented justice. The founders of the United States were heavily influenced by the democratic legacy of ancient Greece. They modeled the Supreme Court. Now, she said influenced heavily. And according to my research for today's stream, that was not necessarily the case. Um, Thucydides and uh, who was it? Thucydides and Pericles, I believe, are actually the two. Oh, Plutarch. I'm sorry. Thucydides and Plutarch are the two sources that the founding fathers at that time in history had access to even understand what Athenian democracy was. And the reasons why American democracy is considered indirect, where Athenian democracy was direct, is had to do with this idea that the mob essentially ruled. And in the Athenian context, that was the case. In the American context, they were very worried about the limits of power and factions of power. And we're going to talk about James Madison and, and, and the structures of the U.S. government to sort of limit the uh, conglomeration of power in any one area. But uh, they were very much influenced by Rome. And that's why often people will say, well, America is a republic. It's not a democracy. Well, that's true. But as according to my research, and I actually have one academic article we're going to look at just to look at some of the influence of the founding fathers and how they understood uh, these ideals, they're very much influenced by ancient Rome. And that's why we have a representative. Now, there's a few reasons for that. America was so large, not everybody could be, especially in high numbers, in a single place to make a single vote, where within the Athenian context, it was a city state. It was a local government. And it limited, again, who could participate to Greek Athenian males who were free. And typically that had some power. But we'll get into a little bit about why Athenian democracy was unique, but because it actually did give power, some power to poor people. Um, the, the, 
the Thetis, and we'll we'll discuss that here in a minute. But she said, oh, uh, dramatically influenced by ancient Greece. Not so much uh, because they didn't have a whole lot of resources to even understand Athenian democracy. And in fact, some of the founding fathers were critical of it because they saw the collapse of, of Athenian democracy due to the mob having too much power. So just keep that in mind. The Capitol and the White House on Greek temples to promote their democratic ideals. In New York's harbor, the Statue of Liberty represents freedom and refuge for those in need and was based on the ancient Colossus of Rhodes. In more recent years, Americans have created new symbols representing equality and diversity. What sorts of symbols do you see in your community? Okay, and then this is uh, voting in ancient Athens. Today, when Americans vote in elections, they choose people to represent their interests in government. But in ancient Athens, Citizens voted on every issue facing their city. So what else was different about voting in the birthplace of democracy? For a start, only free adult native Athenian men or citizens were allowed to vote. This meant that around 90% of people in Athens had no say in how their city was run. Now, I will highlight that I think this is one of the reasons why they were able to have a direct form of democracy last for 200 years um, because one of, we, one of the questions we'll get into in regards to the criticisms of democracy is who exactly is allowed to vote and participate in the democratic structure. For ancient Athens and the Greeks, they, they had a homogenous population of people that had a shared interest and values and long-term vision for the city-state, Athens itself. When we start looking in the contemporary context, there just is no historical example for heterogeneous populations of massive amounts of people, high numbers that are especially geographically uh, separated to large extents like the United States, um, being able to withstand things like long term visions, shared values, shared interests and, and such. And this is, I think, part and parcel of we see the collapse of the Western world. Let's just speak specifically about America right now is I've talked before that there is no uh, shared American ethos. And I've used theories like a sociological theory from Peter Berger called the sacred canopy. And he believes that the sacred canopy is a collection of symbols. That's why I think symbols are important. Collection of symbols, myths, stories, narratives, national heroes that are what he considered uh, legitimated by an externalization, and an, uh, an objectivization, and then an internalization by the people. So they externalize the symbols, they become objective symbols in the culture, and then the people re-internalize those. And this creates a feedback loop that then colors or creates a sacred canopy that unites people. And I would say what we have in the United States is we have a ruptured sacred canopy. There isn't really a shared mythos. There is not a shared ideal. We don't even have shared heroes as we see People like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Robert E. Lee, their statues are being taken down for the, uh, you know, the, the post hoc imposition of contemporary values on men from the 18th century as if somehow they're supposed to live up to our ideals today. And because they don't, we need to disregard and sort of erase history. Now, obviously, the erasing of history is important to things like the Chinese Cultural Revolution. And we've seen that with sort of even the Soviet uh, Soviet Union and Russia. So when communism takes place, when a new structure is emerging, it's very important to sever the sacred canopy, take away a shared mythos and do away with historic identity. And, I, and we'll get into a little bit of identity and historic identity and one of the problems I think America has regarding that. But I just wanted to make this clear because... Um, the question of who's able to vote and who's able to participate in democracy is still an ongoing question, even in today, as I'm sure you guys saw that illegal aliens in certain parts of our countries are allowed to vote. Now, people who are very much in favor of democracy believe that, oh, well, they sh absolutely should. But people like, again, the ancient Greeks would say, well, what are you doing? You're, you're undermining your own democratic ideals because you're allowing people that are outside the interest, outside the sacred canopy of your group structure to now have voice and equal power of representation uh, to decide the future of your nation. That doesn't make any sense. So 
right now, even in America in 2024, as we know, many illegals and many fake ballots are being casted and therefore calling into question again, who exactly is able to vote and whether it's fully democratic and those saying that we need illegal aliens to vote are in favor of this sort of radical ideal of democracy. But as we see here in the foundation and the catalyst of democracy in, in history, ancient Athens, they were aware that it had to be limited. It had to be limited to people that had a vestal interest into the city state for them or into our nations and looking long-term into the future to decide what they're going to do. Unlike American democracy, where voting is not compulsory, each Athenian citizen had a duty to vote on issues like public spending, food supply, and how best to defend the city from invaders. They voted either by raising their hands, which wasn't always easy to count, or by placing pebbles or pieces of pottery into urns or boxes. A majority decided the outcome. Those who didn't fulfill their duty to vote could be fined, or even painted red as a mark of shame. Most government positions were filled by ordinary Athenian citizens who were required to serve in government. Citizens were chosen by lottery in a process known as sortition and were regularly rotated out of office so that everyone had the chance to serve, no matter their class or popularity. But some government officials were elected to office by public vote, like military generals who had to convince voters they had the skills for the job. Athenians could also vote to cast out government officials who were corrupt or a threat to democracy through a process known as ostracism. Now, this is a little bit confusing. I don't think they do a very good job highlighting what ostracism is because it's not just about voting out corrupt people within the government structure. Uh, ostracism was about actually ostracizing certain people from the public itself. They would have to leave Athens for a minimum of, of 10 years, a decade. And this was believed because the people voted that they didn't want them to be part of society, whether they were too contentious, there's too much of an uproar, or there, there's too much corruption. However, what they're trying to highlight and what I think would be a better way of explaining it is the rule of law. So as we'll get into the, what, the number one principal foundation for democracy, both in the Athenian and the American context, was the idea that every single person was under the same law, the same rule of law. And so before democracy and in Athens, the archons, the people of the Areopagus or the Areopagus, they were there for life and they really could not be prosecuted for any wrongdoing. Therefore, they were sort of protected and they were outside the context of the law within Athens. When Solon comes in and makes his reforms. The rule of law is the number one foundation, which was novel because now within the Athenian context, the populace, the demos, they could come if, if say there was a politician and even an archon that was corrupt or was doing something nefarious, they could come together in the assembly, they could vote in numbers and they could kick them out right then and there. So that was the rule of law. And so again, when we look at the American context, and right now we already see that we live in a two-tier justice system. And so based on that alone calls into question how much of a democratic republic we actually live in right now, because if certain people are not under the rule of law to the same degree that the general populace is, well, then by definition, we are no longer actually in a democracy because this, along with free speech are some of the bedrocks for how a de democratic structure is supposed to survive and supposed to proffer, uh, prosper. So um, I just bring that in. I, I just bring that up because I think that's really interesting. When I was going through here and looking at Solon's reforms, the number one was the uh, rule of law being applied to all free men, both those ruling in the government and those in the, in the general public. And when we look in the American context, it's very interesting that the people who are yammering on about democracy is under threat, democracy is under threat, we got to save democracy, are also the same people that are okay with the fact that not everybody is equal under the law. I mean, let's look at Epstein, for example. We know for a fact that many powerful people in the United States, both in the government and the public and corporate life of this country, were part and parcel of a major scheme to have sexual assault against children. 
and underage minors. And yet our government is not interested in prosecuting any of those people. Now, that is a fundamental bedrock to any sort of free democratic society. You can look at the prosecution of Donald Trump, no matter what you think about him. We know that it's a sham and we know that this is politically motivated to alter the state of the 2024 election. It's hard to say from this perspective that America in its contemporary context is maintaining the ideals that the founders wanted from the get-go. Now, again, I'm not here to defend democracy. That's not the point of the stream. It's provided a historical overview. Obviously, I think by looking at this research and looking at some of the criticisms of democracy that one of the benefits of, of monarchy is that it is more efficient, that it can get a decision done and enacted much quicker than a democratic nation state. Do I think that uh, the Enlightenment ideals of doing away with feudalism and empowering the people was a uh, notable, noteworthy idea. Yeah, I think it was. However, as we've seen, the Enlightenment project, beginning with America and the American Revolution, has really been crumbling year after year after year. And we see that the state that we're in with this, this ethos of equality, liberty, and fraternity has led to diversity, equity, and inclusion and is really an attempt to subvert and dis disorient and undermine the in fact, the same structures that they say that they are promoting. So I just want to keep all that out front. The name of the offender was carved onto a small piece of clay called an ostracon. If enough votes were cast against the wrongdoer, they were banished from the city for 10 years. What are some other differences between American? Okay. So there's a little bit of an introduction to the Athenian democratic form and just highlighting some of those noteworthy aspects. So now I got notes that we're going to get into a little bit more details. And I want to explain to you guys more of a historical overview of what Athenian democracy was like. So democracy is derived from the Greek word demokratia, meaning rule by the people. And as I said, my working definition for today's stream of what a democracy is, is where people living under political institutions exercise control over those political institutions. And so within the uh, Athenian context, it has its earliest roots uh, in the fifth century, as we've already talked about, and it emerged as a radical form of governance when compared to the prevailing system of monarchy and oligarchy at the time. And so there's three major, uh, you could call them reforms or influences. The first one being Solon, who laid the foundational changes by alleviating debt and redistributing political power from the aristocracy and the wealthy, which again, the vast majority of the Athenian populace at that time was indebted to these aristocratic noble elites within Athens. And because there was going to be so much uprest and upheaval that Solon came and said, look, we're going to do away with their debts and we're going to issue them political power to avoid the upheaval that's getting ready to happen. And this was resisted, obviously, by the aristocrats and the elites. And this is going to be true even later in Athenian democracy. There's quotes from Aristotle and Plato highlighting their their contempt, uh, at least certain people's contempt for democracy, because there's always a contention. When we start looking at democracy, there's always a contention between the few and the many. And you, I was, as I was reading through it, I kept referencing back in my mind the philosophical dialectic between the one and the many, right? Which one's more real, the one or the many? Um, and when we look at these government structures, this is also true. Which one has the most power? Which one should have the power, the few or the many? Obviously, for Plato, in, if you've read The Republic, he wanted a sort of educated elite to rule, and he believed that democracy was actually uh, inept and that giving incompetent people, in his frame, the power to vote and make decisions for the city-state was moronic. And he believed in more of a sort of oligarchy, an elite oligarchy that was going to rule the country. So Eventually, there's quotes that I found from these Greek elites that said that they wanted to enact evil against the demos, the populace, the people, because they felt that they had too much power. And when you look at America, you know, it sure feels like we're moving uh, not not towards the democratic ideals, but certainly further away where fewer and fewer people have the majority of the wealth 
and the demos, the populace, the people are more and more indebted to those elites. So I just wanted to make that the case because when we look at the American context, I think we can still see the war raging between the few and the many. But the difference is with, and we'll get into media and propaganda and from some of the problems with democracy, the criticisms that aren't just mine, but have been leveled by academics uh, for the last really uh, 300 years, that you have to have an educated, informed populace. And we unfortunately do not. And so the divisions amongst the masses are ways in which the elite can preserve their power and actually acquire more power within a democratic structure. So, um, and, and, that, and, and, and that's ultimately going to undermine democracy, which I think we all know that we're moving towards a centralized government, whether that be the new world order or even nation states becoming more explicitly communist. So, okay. So Solon's reforms, uh, and, and so then he redistributed political power from the uh, aristocracy and the wealthy based on income rather than birth. And so then, uh, uh, Clinthy's reforms in 508 to 507 introduced more radical reforms that established the basis for Athenian democracy, including the restructuring of the tribal system and increasing the power of the assembly, the ecclesia, where citizens could participate directly in legislative decisions. And so this is really important because what Athenian democracy becomes is it moves from the ultimate power of a small group of people to the ecclesia, the assembly becomes the ultimate source of power. And this is where uh, the average man, again, a, 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 a ma adult male free Athenian can come here and cast votes on decisions of wartime, economics, taxes, and they would meet 10 times a year at the Pinnix. So this was a particular place in Athens out, um, where the votes would occur. And so the ability of the assembly to overturn the decisions of the Council of 500 or the Areopagus, this is what made Athenian democracy so unique, is that literally the, the Athenian men could come together and they could make decisions right then and there based on their direct de democratic voting. Now, Pericles uh, also had a major influence, and this is around 461 through 429, and he expanded democracy through the payment for public offices and jury duties, allowing even the poorest citizens to participate in the state's affairs. And this was novel, because before there was still a class structure in regards to Athenian democracy in which that the wealthier aristocratic people had more power and more status than the, the thetis, the, the poor people, the manual laborers. You can think of it as the lower blue collar, the lower middle class. But what happens after Pericles is that the thetis were able to participate in the assembly. And so they, them, they themselves could actually begin to vote out the most powerful people. Um, now, some of the unique characteristics of Athenian democracy is what's called direct democracy. And this really is purely mob rule. And so all decisions are made directly by the citizens who attended the assemblies without any sort of intermediary representatives. This is one of the big distinctions between American democracy and Athenian democracy is we have an indirect democracy in which we don't uh, we don't control the government itself. We control through election the representatives who represent us, who then control the government. And so we'll highlight how this is problematic because if the representatives are controlled, well, then the people, no matter how many elections and even if they were totally uh, fair and free, still do not actually control the government. And so, again, working our working definition where the people under a political institution exercise control over the political institution. And one of the questions when we look at American democracy is, do the people in America still exercise full sovereignty and control over its government? And I think the question and the answer to that question is going to become no. It, it doesn't seem like we do anymore. So direct democracy is mob rule, but this is what was unique about Athenian democracy, along with the lottery system. So as that, as that video mentioned, when we look at the assembly, um, most public officials were chosen by lot, literally their names, essentially a metaphor pulled out of a hat. And this was seen as a democratic way to prevent corruption and power accumulation. So therefore, a a poor, lower middle class working person 
could actually be elevated to the assembly as a, as, um, or, or part of the council of 500. So, um, that was huge. And they viewed that as very democratic where again, you can look at the American context. Do we, we don't really have a lottery system because the people who run for office are in ways chosen by other powerful institutions. When we look at super PACs, when we look at the political, um, um, uh, the political parties choosing who their representatives are. When we look at the donor money behind certain candidates, unfortunately, in the American context, we cannot just elect anybody we want to elect. And now in, 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 in a very explicit case, that's even Donald Trump with the attacks that are going on right now. Well, no matter what you think about Donald Trump, I'm not here to defend Donald Trump. My point is in a, uh, in a in a authentic democracy, something that was more akin to the Athenian context, we would be able to elect whoever we wanted, and then limited citizenship. So political rights were limited, as I said, to male citizens who completed military training. Women, slaves, and all foreigners were excluded from any democratic process with that within Athens. Any demo so. And this is where uh, some of the contemporary academics and scholars are critical of Athens because they made explicit that the role of women was to be in the home. And, and I have this one point that I thought was really interesting, that when the Greeks were formulating their democratic ideals, they said that there's a difference between the rulers and the ruled. And the main distinction is that the rulers rule with their mind, meaning these are people that are led by a sort of conscious um, self-critical, uh, uh, thinking behavior. Whereas they said the ruled people that are ruled are ruled by the body, ruled by the body. And so they associated men with, uh, being typically ruled by mind, being more rational. And they uh, equated women with being more ruled by the body. But I was thinking about this and I was thinking about OnlyFans and the sexual degeneracy in our country. And, you know, it seems in a way that in the American populace, more and more people are becoming ruled by their body. And the ability to not be ruled by your body means that you can never actually be part of the ruling class or rule anybody else because you're ruled by your own body. So I thought that was really interesting. Uh, but anyways, moving on here. Comparing Athens then to the democracy of the United States, um, in the United States, we have foundational documents, the Declaration of Independence, 1776. We have the Constitution, 1787, uh, established the legal and philosophical basis for American democracy. We have the Federalist Papers written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. These documents argued for a strong federal government and a system of checks and balances because unlike the Athenians, uh, the founding fathers were very worried about political factions. And I think it was Madison that described a faction is really in, in the world of politics. Politics are described by factions and factions are different subgroups of people that have certain political ideals or ambitions. And he argued that no matter what the faction is and no matter what the faction is looking for, the faction will always do what's in best for the preservation and the um, establishment of those factions ideals. And therefore he was afraid that if enough people of the same faction became the majority that they would dominate. And a perfect example of this would be Shay's rebellion. If you guys are familiar with Shay's rebellion, um, here, let me pull that up real quick. Uh, are you guys, so that would be right here. So Shay's Rebellion, this was when, uh, right after the founding of the country. So this is during 1786 and 1787. This is when fighting took place because revolutionaries or the, the Shay sites, uh, who protested against the economic and civil rights injustices by the Massachusetts government. And they wanted to take over the Springfield armory. And basically uh, they felt they were being overly taxed. Well, this was part and parcel of, of, again, these checks and balances that some of the founding fathers thought, well, geez, if enough people decide that they don't want to pay taxes to the federal government, well, that could be a problem because they could just overthrow the government itself. And therefore, they created all these checks and balances to limit. And we'll look into the legislative branches, you know, the, the executive, the legislative and the judicial. Um, but anyways, moving forward, we have the Bill of Rights, 1791. 
uh, the unique attributes of American democracy is that it's a representative democracy. Therefore, it's an indirect democracy and in that citizens only elect representatives. They do not have total political control over the government itself. And those representatives make decisions on their behalf, a system designed to manage the large and geographic uh, state of the United States, which, okay, that makes sense. Uh, you can't have a direct democracy like Athens when somebody lives in California or, or Washington state and they're having a vote within an hour in Washington, DC, that doesn't really work. So that's part of the logic behind why the founding fathers wanted a representative democracy. Then we have a constitutional framework and constitutional ideals really come out of the enlightenment. So there was no constitution for the Athenian democratic structure. Constitutions was it's a written constitution that outlines the structure of the government and the rights of individuals, including amendments to adapt to changing conditions. And this is because, as we've talked about with the Enlightenment, it goes back to the valoriza valorization of the ideals of equality, fraternity and liberty. Now, equality and liberty were the main ones for uh, the United States. Um, and then. Really, in regards to fraternity, you could really use independence as the third ideal for the founding fathers, which is why they associate the pursuit of happiness. Well, the pursuit of happiness is indicative of an independent free person being able to pursue their own desired ideals and their desired ends. So equality, though, in the American context, and this is explicit, it was not equity. It was the belief that in in Thomas Jefferson wrote that all men are created equal, right? And this is the idea that that's what equality is and that we all begin from the same place, but um, it's not about equality of outcome. It was about the establishing of an authentic meritocracy. That was the ideal of the democracy uh, or the equality and liberty and independence within the American context. Whether you think that came to fruition or not, that certainly begs uh, questioning and deserves answers, but that was the, at least the intended ideal. And then we had federalism, which is, again, very different in regards to other forms of democracy. So federalism is power is divided between the national and the state governments, allowing for local autonomy within a uni united framework. And obviously, when we look at the Civil War, uh, federalism was a main driver to the conflict of the Civil War. This is I'm not going to go into the details of the Civil War or not, but let's just say it was there was more problems going on than just slavery. OK, because the majority of Southerners who fought in the Civil War, they didn't even own slaves. It was about monetary policy. It was about the it was about uh, federal power, states rights, these types of things. And so you can see and this is one of the things that have been noted throughout history that men or any institution that is given power will always, always under all circumstances, try to acquire more power. And so I think there's a really strong case that shows that the United States is, in fact, uh, becoming more and more a centrally uh, not federalist in the sense of states power, but federally centrally powered by the federal government. So wanted to put that out there. Now, some of the big differences, again, between Athenian and American democracies was the form of participation. Athenian, like I said, is direct democracy, involvement in decision making. American is indirect participation in democracy. Uh, the inclusion of citizens. So in Athenian democracy, only male Athenian free men were allowed to vote. In American, initially limited to property owning white men. So we still see the initial ethos of the American democratic structure was that uh, white free men that owned property, owned property because they, in the American context, and I'm going to say more about this, in the American context, they saw the ownership of property as indicative of independence. And so that was a huge differentiation between like a feudal system or even a monarchical system where the, the land is privately owned. They said, no, we want public ownership or we want private ownership of the land by the public, by the citizens. And they viewed that then property ownership was essential for any people to be free. Now I bring it back to America in 2024. Are they making it easier for us to own private property? Or are they making it harder for us to own private property? And if they're making it harder for us to own private property, which is obviously the case, well, then they're moving in directly in opposition to the promotion of any sort of individual freedom in this country. 
So just throwing that out there as well. Government structure differences. Athenian was primarily focused on the assembly and the councils, which limited executive roles, and the American was structured with separate executive, legislative, and, ju and uh, judicial branches, each defined and have their own powers and controls over the other branches of government. And then the legal framework is that the Athenians lacked a written constitution. As I said, this is really an enlightenment ideal. And so the laws were created and could be changed by the assembly at any point. That was one of the things about the, uh, the Athenian democracy in which the, the assembly did, the free men did. A laws would be created. They didn't like them anymore. They would vote. They'd do away with that law. In the American context, uh, we have a governed by a constitution that only guides the legal system, but also restricts governmental powers through checks and balances. And then the rule of law, as I said, uh, decisions often based on majority rule within the Athenian context, within the American context, emphasis on the protection of individual and minority rights through a detailed bill of rights and ongoing legal interpretations. Now, the key institutions for Athenian democracy. Let me pull down Shay's Rebellion. We're not talking about that anymore. So the, the, some of the key elements or the key structures of Athenian democracy is number one, as I said, the ecclesia, the assembly, the, the role. Of, this is the center of power in American democracy. And this is where the average man, as long as you are male, adult and free and Athenian, you could participate. The assembly was the principal decision making body in the Athenian democracy. All citizens had the right to attend its meetings, speak, and vote on legislation, foreign policy, and other critical matters. The meetings were held at the Penix, a hill in Athens, and the assembly met around uh, 10 to 40 times a year, depending on the situation. And so in Athens, one of the problems that were emerging over and over and over and over is the, the problem of war, that war the whether you know whoever it may be obviously they had, they had many enemies and really the defeat of the persians at salamis and marathon was essential for giving uh the athenians a sort of the average athenian soldier a sense of self-confidence that is why they wanted to enact and establish democracy in the first place and we're going to talk a little bit about that in here in just a second i have all these notes but military um, participation and military service and competency was very much tied with political ascendancy. So within the Athenian context, a great warrior, a great general was seemed to be worthy to sort of have voice and opinion and power over the populace. And we even see this in the American context with George Washington. Well, so we see this mirrored also in America that the men that were willing to fight and die and lead men in battle were deemed worthy then to lead the populace, generally speaking. You can look at somebody like Andrew Jackson as another uh, indicator of this. Now, you look at contemporary America. Look at America in 2024. Uh, even including Donald Trump, do we have people that are going to be representative or uh, important players in American democracy that have ever led men in war that are great warriors that would be willing to die for the nation state? Of course not. Of course not. But historically, that was always a attribute that was valorized by the people. And so I, I just want to throw that in there as well. Um, so uh, the powers that the assembly had is that it had the ultimate authority on almost every aspect of public policy, including laws, war, and financial decisions. Then they had the Council of 500. This is the role. The Council of 500 was responsible for administrating the decisions made by the assembly and handling the daily affairs of the state. This is where uh, people by lottery were appointed to the the Council of 500. And so the average person, and they were always being uh, sifted through could be part of the powerful Council of 500. Um, the members of the council were chosen by lot, a method believed to be the most democratic as it prevented power accumulation and corruption. Each of Athens' 10 tribes provided 50 members. And so this is one of the, uh, one of the reforms that was done by, uh, who, who was it? It was um, uh, Clinthes that... Um, that uh, wanted to have the 10 tribes of Athens basically appoint their 50 representatives to the Council of 500. Um, 
Then we have uh, the task of the Council of 500, which the council prepared legislation for consideration and approval by the assembly, supervised government officials and managed dim uh, dim diplomatic relations. And then you have the courts in Athens. And obviously they were crucial for maintaining justice and handling legal disputes. Unlike modern courts, they did not have any professional judges. Instead, a large, instead of large juries of citizens, they were selected by lot to hear cases and decide outcomes. Um, and then the jurisdiction, they dealt with a wide ranging of issues, including criminal trials, civil disputes, political misconduct, and, and the like. And then we talked about the magistrates, the additional mechanisms, the archons were uh, selected by lot. These officials carried out various administrative and judicial duties, but where powers were significantly curtailed compared to early pre-democratic times because the archons of the Areopagus, they were there, they were appointed for life. And again, they were not under the same rule of law. And then ostracism where they can, you know, if you really did something bad and 6,000 Athenians decided you need to go, they can literally vote you out of the city state and you cannot come back for 10 years. And if you do, you could be physically harmed. Um, so now I want to make a few points again, looking at Athens specifically here. Um, 507 is when the Athenians really began to adopt uh, democracy. And in 404, Athens loses to Sparta, which was one of the brief periods in which the, demo the, the democratic golden age was broken up because Sparta ruled over Athens for a short period of time. But democracy in this golden age ends, as we said, in 321 by Macedonia and their winning of, of these battles at that time. Now, the Athenians and Greeks cherished wisdom. And when I reflected on what did the, the Americans uh, really valorize when they founded the country, and I think it's capital. Now, I don't know. I don't know of any scholar or if there's been any academic work done on this. So this is my own personal opinion. But the ways in which the, the Greeks and the Athenians specifically valorized men of wisdom meaning holding up as, as cultural figures. They became popular. You know, Again, think of Plato and Socrates and, and Aristotle. These were men who were, who were deemed to be incredibly wise, incredibly erudite, and those characteristics were valorized by the populace. In the American context, you could say to some degree it was that, but I would really put my finger on the thing that was really valorized in the American context in the forming of our democracy was about capital and money. And we've talked a little bit about Max Weber's thesis of the Protestant work ethic and that because of the lack of a sort of sacramental reality and because of some of the theological errors of Calvinism as such, people began to associate hard work and labor as ways in which they could become worthy in God's eyes. Because again, the sola fide, the, the single proclamation of your faith was deemed that, you know, you were ass assured that you were going to be saved if you were died, you're going to make it to the kingdom. But a ways in which Protestants really acted out, because again, they're, they are against works, no works, no works. But according to James, uh, you know, without works, faith alone is dead. Um, that the Protestants really began to see labor and the acquisition of capital as essential for independence and a sort of elevation of the of the modern man, or, or at least the Enlightenment man. And I think we still see that in America, right? What do we valorize? We valorize people that make a lot of money. We valorize the people like the Bezoses of the world, the Elon Musk of the world, professional athletes that make you know enormous amounts of sums to play sports. I think that is still part of the American ethos is that we actually as a populace do not valorize wisdom. We valorize capital. We valorize capital. So again, that's my own opinion, but I'm going to throw that out there. I think it's accurate. You guys can let me know if you disagree or not. Um, and so they cherished wisdom and they believed that living under a rational law, this is why um, Solon and his reform about the rule of law was so important because the Greeks presupposed that living under a rational law civilized men, that men without law, anarchy, would become barbarous and that they would revert to non-natural or at least irrational behavior. Okay, that makes sense to me. 
And so they believe that with a rule, with the rule of law, that everybody was subject to the same rational law, that men would become less barbarous and more civilized. And therefore, the rule of law, not limited to democracy, was essential for a civilized democracy. Without everybody being under the same rule of law, there is no such thing as a civilized democracy. Because what we have then is really just a, a distorted, quote unquote, democratic structure in which the people that are outside the rule of law are going to control the levers of government and power, which looks like that's what we have. So um, for then, everyone was under the same law. And uh, this, was a, this was a Greek term called isonomia isonomia, that there was a quality for everyone under the law, that the Athenians did not believe that everybody was equal um, in the sense, at least not in the Jeffersonian Declaration of Independence sense, and they didn't believe that everybody was equal in, in competency and skill sets, but they believed that everybody should be equal under the rule of law, which there would equally civilize the populace and allow for more justice to occur, at least in their in the perspective. And this was an essential Western idea. So Western civilization was has sort of been founded on this principle of the rule of law that we really get from this uh, golden era within Athenian democracy. And as I said, military service was highly, highly privileged within the with the Athenian context. And the link be grew between military service and political power which again, even in the American context, we can see with George Washington and somebody like um, Andrew Jackson. Um, so the Athenian citizens grew in confidence. As I, as I mentioned, uh, Athenian democracy, really, you could make an argument, at least I would make an argument, could not exist without their def the defeating of the Persians at Marathon and Salamis. Because the Athenians at this time, this little city state was able to defeat the largest empire in the world at that point, it gave so much confidence to the populace that they felt like they could rule themselves. And you can see that again, flip flop with looking at the American context. The American Revolution was 13 colonies and really 10% of the population of, of fighting men were able to overthrow the largest gov you know, military and, and government power in the world at the time, which was the British Empire. And so it's so interesting. I think there's a correlation there that, that it, it's not explicit, but it's interesting nonetheless that needs to be enumerated, that, that the people of these nations that found these sort of democratic ideals in both instances, within the American and the Athenian context, it comes after a great victory of what was perceived to be the greatest power in the world at that time. And so um, we talked about Solon's reforms. We talked about the Areopagus. Um, where were the democratic decisions made? The, pen the Penix, we talked about that in the assembly. And so in the assembly, another thing that was essential for Athenian democracy, which was true for the American context, was isogonia or isogoria i'm sorry isogoria is the greek word for essentially free public political speech and so they had free speech and they were allowed to say let's say non-politically correct things and they believed that having free speech and when the assembly the average men were able to come together and it was outdoors uh, from I was reading about some of the instances. They said it was sometimes difficult because it was outdoors that, you know, men would have to stand up. Everybody else would have to be quiet and they would have to shout their ideals or whatever it is that they wanted to say. But they thought that was essential, that the body politic should be able to say anything regarding the concerns and the well-being of the state itself. Now, you look again at the contemporary state of America. Are we, do we have free speech? Literally, the new CEO of NPR, which is a publicly funded corporation, said that the, the number one hurdle they have as a news agency is the free speech, the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Why would the media's biggest threat be free speech? I thought we lived in a democracy. I thought we lived in a democracy. I thought everybody was telling me on NPR about how I had democracies uh, under threat and why we need more and more democracy and why we got to go to Iraq and Afghanistan to spread democracy, why we got to go to Ukraine to spread democracy. What's going on here? It seems to me that America and the political power seem to be almost entirely in opposition 
to these founding principles that they say they're in favor for. Interesting. So the assembly had, as I said, the real power and, and they could veto uh, something that came from the Council of 500. They could rewrite it or they could veto it and rewrite a new bill completely right there on the spot and then force the council to push it through. And so another interesting thing that I found is that one of the reasons why Athenian democracy fell, obviously Macedon comes and they conquer, but one of the problems that emerged is that they began to pay public officials more and more money. And therefore, Athenian democracy depended on empire. It depended on the expansion of the city-state of Athens. Without the expansion of the city-state of Athens, it was unable to provide enough wealth and monetary success to maintain the system that is. And you see the same thing in the American context, that this American democracy and American freedom that we're sort of always told about is dependent upon, dependent upon the expansion of the empire. Very interesting. So increased pay for political positions meant that the city-state of Athens constantly had to expand its territory. And when we look at the, or the American context, we see that American senators and, and congressmen are making more and more money through the playing of the stocks in the market, right? So the stock market, we look at Nancy Pelosi, look at Dan Crenshaw, Interesting that so the public officials have to get more and more money and requiring and having access to more money depends on the expansion of the empire, which is obviously tied to the military industrial complex, which is exactly part of the American system itself. And we see that probably like Athens, the military industrial complex is going to be part and parcel for the collapse of the American democratic experiment. Very interesting connection there that I would not have I would not have registered until looking into this topic a little bit more. So um, the military industrial complex and the lobbyists and the donors and the people that are incentivizing our representatives, who are the only people that we as a democratic republic only have uh, power over. The only thing we have power is our representatives, which is obviously controlled. The, the super PACs, the political parties, the donors, they get to choose who exactly we can vote for. And yet they are getting wealthier, wealthier, and wealthier through the expansion of the, of the military industrial complex. And that's what, that, what's, that is what the Uniparty is. Big Pharma, the MIC, the military industrial complex, Israel. These are the things that unify both parties. And it's kind of indicative of the expansion of the empire. So uh, again, also... As I noted, um, Athenian aristocrats and Greeks, generally nobles, saw democracy as unnatural. They saw it as unjust and they saw it as incompetent and vulgar. And one of the reasons why they saw it as unjust is they didn't believe that the demos, the average person, deserved the power that they were given under a democratic uh, form of government. Because they believed, like Plato in the Republic, that only the elites should have this power that only through the uh, rising through the aristocratic and noble structure, um, only these people that are highly educated, that have access to wealth, only they should be able to make the decisions because they're the competent ones. And so by giving power to the people in Athens, this is unjust. This is unnatural. This is for them vulgar and incompetent. And, and I'll get to the point of incompetence because this is actually one of the fundamental criticisms of democracy itself is it's, one, if it, it's incompetency and its inability to focus for long-term goals. And I'm going to bring this up because I got a whole list here of criticisms referring, uh, again, specifically regarding democracy and democracy within the contemporary period. So... The elites literally in Greece vowed to do evil to the masses to, to destroy their democracy. Now, again, I posit, is this possible within the American context? Is it possible that the aristocratic and noble elites that have access to the majority of the money and are not in debt are, are actually contributing evils to our population to destroy whatever little power the people actually have. It looks to be the case. I think anybody with eyes to see and ears to hear say, well, that seems to be the case. It seems like the, the same dialectical fight between the few and the many in Athens 
is also occurring in the American context. However, through technocracy and technology, the few in the elite have more power over the masses than they ever did before. Because at least back in Athens, if you and I all got together, we could go find whoever it is that we didn't like and we could deal with them face to face. But we can't do that today. And part of the technocratic system is what uh, controls this. So in 321, Athens democracy ends. And this is the end of their golden age. This is the end. Uh, this is really what comes next is the, the Hellenic period. And so this um, and, and part of it, like I said, uh, the ending of the golden age and the end of democracy. One of the things that they did is they added a financial requirement to hold office, meaning once they were conquered by Macedon, um, they wanted that only the wealthy would be in control again. And so unlike before where the Thetis, the poor working labor class, sort of low middle class people of Athens, as long as you were male and you were free, whereas before you could participate in the assembly and you could be elevated by lot to the uh, to the Council of 500, they said, uh, no more. You actually have to make this much money now to even participate. So sorry, guys, uh, middle class, lower middle class, you guys are out. Uh, this is only for the wealthy now. And so that kind of signified the end of the golden age of Athenian democracy. Now, I want to move to the American context here and make a few points is that in America, Thomas Jefferson had an interesting quote that I found in a conversation with another gentleman where he says, we see the wisdom of Solon's remarks that no more good must be accepted than the nation can bear. Interesting. No more good should be accepted than the nation can bear. Now, obviously, you can view that in a few different ways. Um, and for Solon, it had to do with uh, giving power to the demos, the populace, and all this different stuff. And, and Thomas Jefferson was one who was much more higher on the ideals of democracy, where we look at somebody like a James Madison was much more interested in the restriction of power compared to Jefferson. And I have an academic article. If we have time, I'll read a little bit about that. But I, I couldn't help but thinking about this again when it comes to Epstein, right? So no more good must be accepted than the nation can bear. Do our leaders think that we can't accept the fact to find out that the majority of people who rule this country are evil, pr participate in debauchery? I don't know. I'll leave that to you. Is, is it part of the parcels that they don't think we're ready? We can handle the truth that it'd be too much good, too much truth. I don't know. I'll leave that for you. But some of the lessons learned from Athens were established within the American context as well. And one of them was class struggle. So America, one of the ways in which they wanted to alleviate the class struggle, which brought down the democracy of Athens, as we already talked about with raising the amount of money you have to have to even participate is they wanted to limit the ability for the few to dominate the many, and they wanted to limit the ability for the many to dominate the few. And so this comes into the checks and balances system. However, few founders, and this is where, at least from my research, I actually push against the video that we watched. From my research, the founders were not heavily influenced by Athens. From what I looked into, the only sources that they would have had at the time of the end of the 18th century to even know about Athenian democracy was Lucidides and Plutarch, Plutarch most specifically. But um, again, if we look at some of the documents and some of the correspondences between the founding fathers, they noted Athens and what they considered mob rule because the majority in the assembly really had all the power they saw this as a problem and they didn't want to go down that path. And so, as I highlighted before, um, Rome was actually the point in which uh, many of the founding fathers look back to as the ideal state. And this is what gets into republicanism or democracy and whatnot. So here's a little thing on uh, the great influences of Rome on the American government. And so it says here that the study of ancient Roman government reveals a civilization that cycled through almost every form of government from oligarchy to tyrant and emperor. It's not until the period leading up to its first century BC that the influence of Rome under modern government is clearly visible in history through when the nation was a republic and, con and control belonged to the Senate. Obviously, we have a Senate and our legislative branch is broken between the Congress and the Senate, right? 
And so the Roman government was made up of an executive, a legislative, and a judicial branch with varying responsibilities. Ah, that's where the American founders got it. And so the executive branch, in times of peace, the executive branch of ancient Rome comprised two councils elected by Roman landowners for 22 or for two year terms. During times of crisis caused by war, a single dictator was elected for six months to oversee the protection and expansion of Roman interests. At all times, the executive branch also contained various bureaucrats who were in charge of arranging festivals and conducting consensus or census. By contrast, the United States is a democracy with only one leader in the executive branch, the president. Now, I highlighted, as it says right there, that during times of crisis, such as war, that they would appoint essentially a dictator. Now, why would that be? Well, as I highlighted, when we look at the efficiency of various government structures, monarchy really is the most efficient. Now, I'm not here to say that every monarchy in history was phenomenal. and it, No, but in an ideal Christian context, in a biblical format, a, a righteous, pious Christian leader in a monarchical system would be the most efficacious and the most efficient for the benevolence of the majority of the people. And that's why, again, even Rome in crises reverted back to a sort of dictatorship. Now, the legislative. The most influential members of the legislator in Rome were those in the Senate. This large body of elected landowners decided how state money was spent and what projects were viable for state funding. The Senate also took control of foreign policy. In particular, the many wars Rome was engaged in as it expanded its territory throughout the first century BC. The roles assigned to individual centers were allocated by the two councils of the executive branch, the ju judicial. The judicial branch of ancient Roman government was very similar to the courts, particularly the Supreme Court of modern day America. Six judges were elected on a biannual basis to administer the law of the land to those who broke it. Unlike the judges in modern U.S., the Roman ju judici or judiciary could actively create sentences and punishments instead of merely following past president or the, sen the sentencing law handed down from the legislative and executive branches. And then another important caveat here is architecture. The great buildings that house various branches of the American government are inspired by Roman architecture. Perhaps the most obvious example of this is seen in the Supreme Court. Cass Gilbert's design draws its inspiration from Roman temple buildings. The staircase, the raised podium, the columns would not be out of place in the Roman Republic. Similarly, the white marble of the Supreme Court and throughout Washington, D.C. was consciously selected to mimic the architectural splendor of ancient Rome. Fluted Doric uh, columns reflecting Roman architecture without any decorations at the top or base are present in many American buildings, including the Federal Hall in New York City. So just wanted to highlight there that when we look at Greek versus Roman influence in the American context, we have to recognize that actually there is much more Roman influence than there was Greek influence. And we're going to get into democracy versus republicanism in just a moment here. So um, republicanism is interesting because when I was looking at, obviously everybody says, oh, we live in a republic. We don't live in a democracy. True. And because we live in a republic, this is why we have a representative or indirect democracy. So we don't, we don't have a direct mob rule democracy. However, many of the founding fathers, when I looked into it, used the words republicanism and democracy interchangeably. And I'll show you why that would probably was. So when we look at the etymology, you know, um, democracy, government of the people, the demos is literally government by the people, by the people. And so when we look at res publica, which is the origin for republic, which is Latin. So we hit democracy comes from the Greeks. Republican comes from the Latin. And so we have the res publica or the public interest, the state, essentially meaning the same thing. And this is why many of the founding fathers use these words interchangeably, because essentially republicanism and democracy means rule by the people. However, how that is enacted is different. 
And many of the founding fathers saw republicanism as the alternative to monarchy. So if you're familiar, obviously that's what uh, World War I was about, was the ending of essentially the monarchies of Europe and around the world to many extent. Um, and that the founding fathers in the late 18th century, they were looking at governmental institutions that were in opposition to what they considered authoritative or tyrant-like structures, specifically monarchy. So this was a huge conversation. And um, even when we look at the colonists in like newspapers and publications, democracy and republicanism were used interchangeably. So there wasn't a, an explicit conscious understanding of the differences of these words um, from the, get, the beginning of the country. I just want to highlight that. And so um, the U.S., when we founded our constitution and the Bill of Rights and all this different stuff, what they were looking at, they used words like citizen to differentiate from a subject because it gets back to monarchy. A subject was somebody who was subject to a hierarchical organization, specifically a monarchy. And so the monarchy had the monarch had subjects. And the founders wanted to do away with the idea of subjects and promote the idea of a citizen. And the citizen was associated with a free man. And so a free man was typically associated with somebody who could have private property. Private property was the essential characteristic for the founding fathers of what it meant to be free. That you were not a subject, but you actually had private property that you owned. And that was under your agency. And because you had that, that's what differentiated you from anybody else living in these different governmental structures. So it became the source of personal authority, the ability to own land. And this is why those are the people who were able to vote when the country was founded. It was white men um, that owned property. So white males, property owners, because if you didn't own property, to some extent in their mind, you weren't fully free yet. You didn't have full authority. And the entire ethos of the American Revolution and the founding of American democracy was to, to free oneself of the dependency of external systems. It was really, that's why in regards to equality, liberty, and fraternity, you can really replace fraternity with independence in the American context, because the, 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 the national ethos was about independence, not being dependent upon anybody else or any other thing. And so there is, there's plenty of land to go around. You own land, you grow your own food, you control your own destiny, and therefore you're not dependent on the monarch in England, or you're not dependent upon other external factors. This is what is really meant by the pursuit of happiness. And I would argue in regard to the constitution. So um, equality of opportunity, as I said, the, the point of equality in the original American context was trying to establish a full meritocracy, which they believed had never truly existed at that point. And so the first rejection of the authoritarian power is sort of the number one principle of what the founding fathers wanted to do. And so we see isonomia and isogoria being essential for this. So uh, isogoria, free speech, isonomia, is equal under the rule of law. So again, they adopt the first two fundamental principles for democracy in America um, for the establishment of their resistance to authoritarian power. And so patriotism in the American context became associated with freeing oneself, as I said, from the dependency of external factors and work in the acquisition of capital became um, the uh, the enterprise as seen as liberating poor people. So right before the revolution, one of the things that was occurring was people were able to acquire wealth at a rate that they had never been able to do previously. So because they're able to acquire wealth, this led to them understanding that the acquisition of capital was essential for freeing poor people. And this is what they thought was happening. So they were going to have more citizens, more free people due to this happening. And, um, and then the second was the skepticism of, of the mon monopoly of power. So we talked about Shays rebellion, pure democracy was seen as uh, dangerous, the, the mob rule and politics was characterized by factions, which we already talked about. And that the representative indirect democracy that people can control elected officials 
but at the same time, they won't have full control over the government itself. So, okay. I got a few more things I want to get into guys, but smash that like for everybody who's here, smash that like, uh, let me just double check. See if any super chats came in real quick, uh, before we get into the rest of today's stream. Thank you all for being here. A major thank you goes out to Adam for sponsoring today's stream. Thank you very, very much, Adam. God bless you, brother. I hope that you're enjoying today's stream. Um, it looks like on YouTube, the first one came in from Austin DeTulio, and he's been a Codal Crew member for one month. And he says, hey, brothers and sisters, I need your prayers as I am being baptized into the Orthodox Church this Sunday. Well, glory to God, Austin. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, I'll be praying. Uh, what are your Christian names? Send me, uh, let me know what your Christian names are. And I will definitely say a prayer for you guys. He says, pray that I give a full life's confession. Well, you better give a full life's confession. And in the confession, anything that you do forget will be uh, included in there. But do your best. It really is cathartic, I promise. Um, let me check the dono chat real quick. Uh, so nothing on the dono chat. Um, over on Streamlabs, uh, we got some super chats that came in. Let me check those out real quick. Uh, First one comes in. Oh, a very generous super chat from Gary throws in $50. No comment. Thank you so much, Gary, for the $50 super chat. Really appreciate that, my man. Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, and then Frankie D throws in $5. Frankie D said, in relation to what you said about technocracy making it difficult for you and me and 6,000 others of the demos to roll up on someone causing problems, a mustache man in a book called uh, Milucha made a similar observation about democracy, no accountability. It, absolutely. Well, that's what I'm getting into next is I'm getting ready to go through the problems with democracy, actual criticisms of whether democracy offers the ideals that it says it does. So, uh, yeah, uh, Great point, Frankie D. And he adds another one for $3. He says, it's funny because just before I read a couple excerpts from the book of struggle, I was having similar thoughts about our reps. I realized that they would destroy millions of lives and then just retire and never face justice. Distributed accountability. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you're making the point that the Greeks already dealt with was that if you cannot hold accountable in powerful positions that do the opposite of what's best for the people, then, uh, oh, frozen screen. My screen's frozen. Can you guys see me? It looks like everything's working on my end. Can you guys see me? Okay, good now. All right. All right. I don't know what was going on. My... It's one of those days with technology, guys. Everything that could go wrong seems to continue to go wrong. Um, so uh, another super chat just came in. Let me bring that up. John Anon throws in $5. Thank you so much, John Anon. He said, would you say that we live in an oligarchy? Does democracy lead to oligarchy? Two wolves and one sheep decide what's for dinner. Yeah, I mean, it, you. I think you obviously could say we live in an oligarchy. Um, I think you could make an argument that in ways it's fascistic because of the alliance that has been made between the federal government and corporate powers that, you know, are we ruled by the government or do the corporations rule our government? Who, who exactly rules the U.S. government, right? Because the answer to that question is going to depend on what exactly, uh, what, we're frozen again? Um, <laughs> okay, I, I don't know what's going on, guys. I'm telling you, it's been one of those days. Everything that can go wrong has seemed to be going wrong. So I, I, I hope nothing happens to the stream. We're almost through here. And again, uh, thank you, Adam, for sponsoring today's stream. Anyways, the question of who exactly rules the federal government, I think, is so important to decide what type of government we actually live in. Because it's not the president. So we don't we don't live in a monarchy. That's for sure. So people who want to say that Donald Trump's going to take us back to a monarchy or he's going to be king emperor, uh, unlikely, very unlikely. We're not ruled by the president. The president and the expansion of the executive power is not our biggest problem. Seems like our biggest problem is the rule uh, in the power of corporate elites and lobbyists and nations such as Israel to influence the representatives, which is the only thing that we in American democracy have power over. The only thing, the only thing that Americans have 
power over is electing the representatives. We, unlike the Athenians, and I'm not in favor of Athenian mob rule, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying one of the big differences is, unlike them, we do not rule over the government. We can only elect representatives, and that whole game has been botched. It's been botched. So the, the representatives are given to us. We cannot even select who it is that we want to represent us truly. So just want to throw that out there. Um, Austin Tulio throws in another five dollars. He says, Saint Gabriel of Georgia, fool for Christ is my patron saint. Your pros would be much appreciated. I think pray, my prayer would be all right. Well, I will say a prayer for um for Gabriel. So thank you very much, Austin. Saint Gabriel of Georgia is a great saint. So glory to God, brother. I wish you and your family the best. And it's wonderful that you guys are gonna be brought into the Orthodox Church. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, and it looks like $10 just came in over on the stream labs. Let me address that one real quick before we get into our criticisms of democracy. Cause I got a whole, I got a whole list here for you guys. Uh, Alvin throws in $10 and says, good stream. Uh, well, thank you very much, brother. I appreciate that. And, uh, John Anon throws in $5 and says between Israel, Britain and American who controls who? Yeah. Good question. Um, so it looks like whenever I go to my, my, um, stream labs video, it looks like that's when it freezes frozen again. I, I don't know what's going on guys. It, it, it's literally one of those days. Anyways, John Anon threw in a super chat and he says between Israel, Britain and America, who controls who, um, I'd say the central banks, I'd say the central banks. So then you figure out who rules the central banks and we'll decide who rules who. So. Anyways, uh, thank you guys so much for the super chats. Let me just check the dono chat real quick. Okay. All right. So now let me get into my criticisms of democracy. Here's the problems with democracy. Number one, as we've already talked about, is the rule of law. Is everybody equal under the rule of law in America? This for the Athenians and the founding fathers was essential to live in a sort of democratic citizenship. Um, I would say we don't. So at least for the first, first principle in regards to the problems of democracy, if there are certain elite, certain noble families, certain aristocratic groups that are outside the confines of the law, well, then you are no longer in a democracy because it's a rule for thee and not for me, which it clearly we see is the case in the United States. The law of the United States does not apply to everyone equally. And therefore, at least from that fundamental principle, that is undemocratic. And so when we look at it from a law standpoint, we do not have a democratic uh, representatives that are all under the same rule of law. Uh, Blue Skittle just threw in $5, says, Dono chat not working for me. Dono chat's not working? I don't know what's going on, guys. I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised. Like I said, it's one of those days. Everything Everything that could go wrong seems to continue to go wrong, but we're here and we're getting through the stream. So I hope you guys are enjoying uh, the content, but thank you very much. Blue Skittle for the $5 super chat. I don't know what's going on with Dono chat. I have no idea. I don't know what's going on with my camera. I don't know what's going on with <laughs> all the technology today. <clears throat> so first problem with democracy is, is everybody under the same rule of law? We've already established, and I think it's quite clear to see, whether it be in Britain, whether it be in Europe. I mean, I've already given the instance of Epstein in America. We know that some of the most powerful people in our country, including former presidents, have been associated with Epstein, and many of the practices that were going on on Epstein Island, have any of them been held accountable? Will any of them ever be held accountable? Of course not. Of course not. So do we live in a democracy? At least not for the for the first principle, which is everybody under the same rule of law. Second one is mob rule. This is a big criticism of democracy. And this is something that I think um, is becoming a problem with America, although we could say that the silent majority, right, that whether it be the MAGA people or the people that support Trump or just patriotic Americans, it does seem at least again, I'm biased. I'm in the Midwest, so I'm surrounded by these people. That is the majority rule. But when we look at the reasons why they're flooding the country with illegal immigrants, and we, we saw recently, I don't know if you guys saw this past week, that 
the flyers that are being given to illegal immigrants in Mexico before they cross the border literally says to vote for Joe Biden so that the border can maintain uh, be maintained open. Um, this is an attempt to rule by the mob, right? They're bringing in voters. Part of the illegal immigration, I would speculate, is that they want them to serve in the military and be a sort of domestic police force. That seems to be possible, especially with senators like Menendez already saying that they want the illegals to be uh, part of the U.S. military. But just to bring more people in for uh, mob rule. Now, who has the power over the minority? And I would say in the U.S., at least as of right now, it's the minority that has the power over the majority. And they are terrified to relinquish that power because they know that they they may not get it. If, if we lived in a state, in a country that had fair and free elections, I think the outcomes would be very different than what we're told for the last decade or so. So another part of the mob rule that the Athenians were worried about is the uneducated populace. So the reasons why the Athenians were not worried about quote unquote mob rule and that the assembly had all the power is they believe that free Athenian Greek men were well-educated. And because of that, they were able to make wise decisions. As we said, they have a shared sacred canopy, a shared national ethos, a shared perspective of the future. And therefore the citizenry was well-educated and therefore could make valuable decisions. And so for them, the mob rule wasn't necessarily a problem. But when we get to another point, which I'll just, I'll just skip to, which is um, the influence of the media and propaganda. So this is one of the third problems with uh, democracies is, right, we have three branches of government, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, right? But I think is quite accurate as people have highlighted that the fourth branch of government is the mainstream media. And so the Athenians thought that their populace was well educated, at least the people that were able to participate in democracy. Are the people in America that are participating in democracy well educated, meaning that they really know the issues, they really know what's going on, they have truthful information? Of course not. Of course not. And this is deliberate. So one of the other problems, along with rule of law and mob rule in regards to democracy, is the influence of media and propaganda, that people aren't informed. Now, if we lived in a real dem democratic structure, the goal would be to truthfully inform the populace as much as possible so that they could have an accurate agency over the structure of government. But we know that that is actually the opposite of what the media is interested in. And so we live in a point in which people are more misinformed or ill-informed than ever before. And so we have more news agencies. We have more ways to gather information. We live in the information age. And yet people are, are more misinformed than ever before. How can we have a democracy if people are ill-informed? And so... The, the media then can create right and wrong think. This is why the media is so powerful. And can you truly have a democracy if the media is able to sway public opinion so significantly in creating social pressure for opinions, right? The point of an educated and informed populace is that you can make accurate decisions. But if we are being pressured to have right or wrong think. And if you have wrong think, then you can be ostracized. You can be fired from your job. You can be ostracized from your community. Well, then this is exerting a new force of pressure that is really anti-democratic because how could the demos, the populace, the people perform their duties if yet their opinions are being pressured and swayed by propaganda and misinformation? And if you say something that goes against the general narrative and consensus, you then can be punished. Well, that is anti-democratic. And so isn't it I irony? But this is the point of evil, right? Evil, um, they always accuse you of what they are doing because it's a form of uh, it's a form of inversion, right? So we see Hillary Clinton do this all the time, right? So the things that she's guilty of, she will say somebody else is doing because that forces the uneducated observer to look at the accusation, the accusation towards the person that she points at. And then she is like the shadow behind the light, right? If you have a flashlight, 
the darkest place to be is right behind the light. And I would say that that's the same thing that's done with evil in regards to um, uh, accusing people of exactly what you're doing is so that the, the flashlight shines and you behind the flashlight are actually in the darkest part. So the eyes are not on you. People do not see you. They see where the flashlight is directed, where the accusation is pointed. And, um, and so we live in a state in which the media is deliberately misinforming the, the populace. Is that democratic? Absolutely not. Uh, number four is a two-party system. I am not the one to bring this up. This has been brought up by many political scientists that highlight that you cannot actually exert a legitimate democracy within a two-party system because a two-party system um, is entirely inefficient and can be easily corrupted because a two-party system limits the voice and the options of the demos, the populace. If there's only two parties to choose from, then even participating in the democratic electoral cycle is already augmented because you can only choose between two options that are already structured and limited. And so what do we have in the United States? We have a two-party system. Whereas in Europe, and I'm not, I'm not here to be in favor of European politics, that's certainly not it either, but at least they have more parties that they can choose from. We in the United States do not. And so the two-party system is entirely inefficient and, again, is anti-democratic because it limits the options and the voice of the people. And when we looked at the founding fathers, they had more than two parties when the country founded. The founding fathers would be horrified by the current state of the Republican and Democrat Party. I mean, it's ridiculous. We've got a couple super chats that just came in. Uh, Crashman throws in $5. Thank you so much, Crashman. He says, the central banks... Now you figure out who controls the central banks. Man, that was so real because we know the answer off the top of our heads. I'll leave that. Exactly. I'll leave that to you guys. Thank you so much, uh, Crashman, for the $5 super chat. And Pim Orso throws in $10. Thank you so much, Pim. He says, if conspiracy is a secret agreement among several people against another, is democracy conspiratorial? That's an interesting question. Um, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, I think, and let me put it this way, based on the question you framed him is, is the stereotyping and the negative connotation of conspiracy part of an anti-democratic endeavor, right? If let's just, let's just grant your premise instead of trying to come down on a decision if democracy it really is conspiratorial because it's about the masses conspiring what to do against the government itself it would make sense why the power that is would want to limit and ostracize and demonize conspiracies themselves does that make sense i'm just throwing that out there but um i think you make an interesting point around is democracy conspiratorial because Technically, that's what it should be. It should be if, 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 if democracy was ideal and if, if we lived in a truly democratic society, people would go to public places, uh, public squares, they would go to their local communities and they would conspire amongst each other about what they're going to do for their local officials. And then with their local officials, they would conspire about what they're going to do for their federal officials. That makes sense. That makes a little bit of sense. So if you then criticize uh, conspiracy, it seems like you're playing right into the hand of limiting democratic voicing. So great point, Pim. Great point, man. You you killed it there. Um, okay, so let me uh, continue on here. In regards to, again, these are criticisms of democracy that I'm going through right now. So we've already said rule of law. Does everybody un live under the same rule necessary for democracy? No, we don't. Um, mob rule, which is always a potential detriment, but mob rule can be good if you have a homogeneous, well-informed populace, which we don't. Um, Two-party system, which is problematic, and that's exactly what we have. And many political scientists, this isn't my opinion, have highlighted that a two-party system is highly inefficient and easily corrupted, which is exactly what we have. And we highlighted the influence of the media because within a democratic society, the role of the media is the best inform the people and actually put 
um, you know, uh, put pressure on powerful positions. But we see that our media is actually ruled by the powerful and is trying to sway and misinform people so that they cannot make an accurate decision. So we have then five points so far. And so far, all of them we've highlighted that they actually are undermined in the American context. Now, uh, another point, and this is a very, very important point about democracy, is its long-term stability. There is no, there is no long-term historical example of a democratic institution. Athens lasted for 200 years, and Athens was highly local and highly homogenous in regards to who was able to participate in it. So we in uh, the U.S. are the oldest living democracy right now, and we are not an old country. And this is one of the problems I'll bring up in regards to um, this long-term stability is that it's so short-sighted. This is, again, this is not my opinion. Other political scientists have highlighted this about dem democracies and democratic elections is that because in democratic nations, people are so focused on being reelected, their only emphasis is on making sure they get votes for the next election cycle. And therefore, as a nation, who is looking at the nation in regards to a hundred year plan? Nobody, nobody is. And so when you look at the interview between Vladimir Putin and Tucker Carlson, which we covered, and the the whole the first 30 minutes of that discussion is Vladimir Putin basically laying out the thousand year history of the Rus people since their conversion to orthodoxy and the geopolitical situation of Ukraine from that period and the importance of Kiev to the Rus people and the Slavs. That is because those people have a historical identity. They have an historical identity. Same thing is with China. Now, I'm not in favor of, of the capitalistic communism of the CCP, but the point is because of the ways in which their government is structured, and, and this is a criticism that China levies at the West, is because of our political structure, they are able to think about the future within the next 10, 20, 50 years. They're already making plans for after Xi Jinping's death. They already are making plans on what the nation's going to do and what directions. It, it came out that they have a hundred year plan for the destruction of America. In America, in Western European societies, nobody is looking for the long term goal. Everything is short sighted. And this is another major criticism and fundamental. Uh, blemish of democratic nation states is because the people in power and the representatives are so focused on getting reelected. Nobody is looking at the nation and looking out for its interest on a long-term vision. And I think that is why no democracy is able to exist for that long of a period. No democracy is able to exist for a long extended, no, you know, the Byzantine empire is over a thousand years. It's the longest empire in world history. That could not happen if it was democratic because it can't have a long enough vision to look and move through the future. And so there's no long-term shared vision of history or geopolitics in America. And this is one of the problems, even if we look at uh, Russia, one of the big differences in, in Russia is multilingual and multicultural, right? We have the Chechenians and, and the uh, Dagestanians and all, all these different people, right, that are in Russia proper. but in America, you know, we don't have any identity. What does it mean to be American? What does it mean to support American ideals? Well, the, the, depending on who you are and who you ask, the answer differs quite significantly. So therefore, we don't even have a shared ethos. We don't have a shared perspective. And we do not even have a shared long-term vision. Some people literally in the country right now are shouting death to America. Now, again, America is so corrupt that I, I think the ending of whatever it is that it's doing right now isn't necessarily a bad thing. But the point is people with U.S. passports that are being brought as U.S. citizens literally are articulating the destruction and the death of the country itself. Um, Henry just threw in uh, $10. He says, what is your opinion on DIM and of the faction in the Orthodox Church that criticizes and downplays the monarchical history of New Rome and the Tsarist Russia cause my USA, my, my us or United States is the best and 
democracy. Uh, Henry, I'm a little confused on what exactly you're saying. What is your opinion of DIM and of the faction in the Orthodox Church that criticizes and downplays the monarchical history of New Rome? Well, I don't know exactly who is doing that, um, but uh, so I, I guess it's a little bit too general for me to give a specific reference to, but I mean, yeah, the U.S. democracy is a joke. I mean, we don't really live in a democratic institution, so I agree with you there. Um, and an, uh, according to Orthodox prophecies, which we'll cover in another stream, you know, Russia is going to play a very central role in the promotion and the and the catalyst for the expansion of Orthodoxy around the world. And potentially, according to some saints, uh, the reconquering of Constantinople and, and eventually giving that back to the Greeks. So that's been prophesied by many saints. So um, I'm not sure what exactly uh, what I, I don't know who you're talking about in regards to the faction of the Orthodox Church that criticizes or downplays uh, monarchical history. I think, again, we can't if you live in a Western country and you're an Orthodox Christian, you can't exactly just create a monarchy. And so I, I think it's wishful thinking. I think it's a it, it's very wishful and uh, naive that because you're an Orthodox Christian, most people which are converts um, think that, OK, well, now I'm a convert to Orthodoxy and I've learned a little bit about Byzantium that we need to institute a monarchy in America. Uh, maybe that'll happen after the Great World War, because that's what we're getting ready to enter is World War Three. And the Great World War is going to reset global power and, and, and structures. And so who knows what America is going to look like after the great war. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, but I do appreciate the $10 super chat, Henry. God bless you, brother. Thank you very much. And we got a handful of super chats over on the stream labs. Um, Orpheus throws in $5, no comment. Thank you so much. Orpheus, uh, store 96 throws in $10 and says, just wanted to say thank you for everything you do. My whole family is getting baptized on Lazarus Saturday. Well, glory to God, uh, store 66. That's great to hear. Also, I don't know why people still believe in presidential elections. They're super fake and gray. Well, obviously we know, again, it's controversial to say in regards to TOS here on, here on YouTube, but uh, yeah, I agree with you. That's another point we're getting ready to get to is that a necessity for democracy is fair and free elections. I'm not going to make any explicit claims because we're live on YouTube, but I'll just ask you guys whether free and fair elections even exist in America or in the West, generally speaking. Um, certainly one of the most easiest ways to secure an election would be voter ID and paper ballots, of which our country does not do. So I agree with you, Store 96, and glory to God, uh, and God bless you and your family for getting baptized. Um, next one came in from Frankie D, throws in $3. He says, I would argue that the conspirator class does have a hundred or even a century long plan. It's just not for the plebs. They have their agenda 2020s and 2030s. One could argue that these Fabian socialists have a multi-century long plan and conspiracy. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Frankie D. I totally agree with that. Um, you know, the agenda 21, uh, the great reset, uh, you know, the Anglo-American empire, you know, Jay's covered the books that the elites have been writing for the last century. Absolutely. They've had their own plan. My point was in regards to nation states and democracy. So, yeah, I, I totally concede and agree with you in regards to the elites having a long term plan. But my point was the problems and the ills of democracy is that democracy actually prevents that nation state having a long term vision because it's so focused on the next election cycle. So do the elites that run these democratic Western nations have a long term plan? Absolutely. It's the new world order. Of course, it's a one world government. It, it, it's the consolidation of all their powers and uh, doing away with nation states so that they don't have to worry about the plebs. So uh, I totally agree with you there, Frankie D. Uh, so thank you very much, brother, for that super chat. And John Anon throws in another five dollars. He said Joe Biden's new campaign slogan is death to America. Uh, it, that'd be probably the truest thing he's ever said if he did run on that. So thank you very much, John Anon. Really appreciate that, my man. Okay, let me get through now the rest of my criticisms here in regards to democracy. So we've already hit it, the rule of law, mob rule, long-term stability, two-party system, the influence of the media. And now I want to get to bribery and corruption. So if we lived in a truly democratic society, we would try to limit 
bribery and corruption to the greatest degree so that our political representatives who are our representatives who represent our will to control the government because only the representatives can control our government, not the people, that we would do everything in our power to limit bribery and corruption. Do we do that? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We can look at the lobbyists and the influence of political policy in America and see how corporations, big pharma, Israel, the military industrial complex, they actually influence the representatives way more than the constituents themselves. So that is another undermining critical factor of democracy because we live in a society that is totally run by bri bribery and corruption. Another one would be blackmail. If we truly lived in a uh, democratic nation and people were living to their highest ideals and moral states, then we wouldn't have political leaders that are constantly being blackmailed, again, a la Epstein, a la P. Diddy, a la, again, Mossad and what they've done for uh, uh, in regards to finding out what some of the degenerate behavior of our political elites do, that would be limited. But in fact, that's the modus operandi of our country. As uh, Whitney Webb has highlighted, uh, and was it a nation under blackmail? That that's exactly what America is. The reason why you actually get elevated, a reason why the super PACs and the donor class will elevate you to become the next Republican candidate for whatever district in Texas or Indiana or whatever state it is, is because they already have the blackmail. They already have you in their pockets. They can already get you to do what they want. So therefore, bribery and corruption is supposed to be one of the things that a true democracy is trying to limit at its greatest degree. And we already see that we have lobbyists and we have a blackmail enterprise in our country. And therefore, as I mentioned earlier, our politicians are acquiring more and more wealth through the stock market. So they then know what the policies they're going to make. They go ahead and invest in those companies. Then they enforce those policies by getting the votes. And now all of a sudden they make an, an enormous return. And it's just, it's just a miracle that, you know, Nancy Pelosi makes what uh, six figures, 200 some thousand a year. And yet her and her husband are worth millions of dollars. Well, how did that happen? Because it's all corrupt and is built on bribery. So there's another one. There's the sixth one, the criticism of democracy that we don't have. As we said, number seven is fair and free elections. Fair and free elections. These are foundational to all democracies. You know, in Athens, it was clear because all the men present are the ones that voted. You could see who voted. The votes were not. Uh, and then they would count them in front of the whole assembly. So everybody knew that if you casted a vote, that your vote was going to count because it was all done in front of the people. A serious nation would have paper ballots and would limit at least non-foreign citizens from participating. But we don't even have that in our country. So we, we don't even have that in the United States. We literally allow dead people and uh, foreign illegals to vote in this country. Arizona, who were people I saw the conservatives were praising Arizona reform their election policy. What comes out from it is that, oh, you have to have voter ID to vote for the state of Arizona. But if you don't, you can vote in federal elections. What? So they reformed the voting process. You have to have a state ID to vote in Arizona for the state, but you can not, you can be an illegal alien and you can vote in the federal election. That's not a reform. That's not a fair and free election. So therefore, we don't have that. So therefore, if, if we don't even have a fair and free election, how can we call it a democracy? It's not. It's not. The PACs and the donors control who the representatives are. It's not a fair and free election. Number eight is non-democratically uh, con controlled institutions. One of the big differences between Athens and America in regards to democratically controlled institutions is that they controlled the military. The assembly controlled the military. They could decide because it was their tribes. It was their brothers. It was their sons that were going to go fight in war. In the U.S., we have things called the intelligence agencies, NSA, the CIA, the FBI. Who control does does the electorate does the do they control the intelligence agencies? Of course not. Of course not. So unlike Athens, in the American context, we have an entire bodies of government institutions that are totally unaccountable to any sort of democratic election or populace at all. And so. 
um, the American intelligence agencies can do whatever they want. They can literally arrest and prosecute the demos, the populace, the citizenry, and they have no recourse to it. They can label you a domestic terrorist. They can go to your trad Catholic mass and say, oh, well, I heard you say something that was uh, uh, critical of Joe Biden. And, and we think that that is part of white supremacy. And all of a sudden we got to raid your house. That's not a democracy. We don't we don't have that. If we actually lived in a democracy, we would have some type of recourse with the intelligence agencies, which we have none. We have none. Number nine. The lack of transparency. This has been brought up by other political scholars in regards to the growth of democratic nations is that the bureaucratic structure of democratic nations becomes so vast that it lacks total transparency, which was another foundational element of democracy and that the citizenry would be able to vote in certain ways. We don't have transparency. We don't even know what our government is doing. We don't know where the money is going. We see, what was it, the DOJ had how many trillions of dollars they can't account for? Did you see recently? I saw just this tax. I just did my taxes, sent an all, a bunch of money to the government, right? And then I see an article that the IRS is missing millions and millions. I think it was a billion dollars, a bit more than a billion dollars that they can't account for. So what you're telling me is that the IRS can arrest me and put me in jail if my taxes are off, but they don't tell me how much I owe. They don't tell me how much I need to pay them. I have to figure that out. But if I get the wrong number, they can arrest me and put me in jail, but they themselves don't even pay their own taxes. And that's supposed to be a democratic nation. Give me a break. Give me a break. This is the problem. Again, this is a criticism of democracy. Democratic nations become so bureaucratic that they can no longer be democratically controlled which is exactly the state. We do, We have zero transparency in our government. We do not know what's going on and we cannot control it in any way. And then uh, number 10, number 10 is unfinished work and term limits. We already talked about the lack of a long-term vision within democratic nations because everybody's focused on election cycles. Well, the, the reverse side of that is because we have constant waves of election cycles every two years, major presidential cycle every four years, you cannot make major reforms because there's not enough time in between periods. At most, you get eight years, and most of the time in between that, the Congress and the Senate flip-flop on who's in, who has majority. So in America, um, the, ma the major elections bring limits to any type of reform to the system itself. Oh, you want to limit the FBI? You want, you want uh, you know, uh, the FISA? You want them to no longer to have uh, warrantless access on American citizens? Oh, too late. We've already passed that. Oh, by the way, um, that's probably going to take multiple years and we have another election cycle and, and that's not going to happen. So within our own structure, reforms and long-term projects like you know building bridges, building roads, building the infrastructure of America, we can't do that because the election cycles are so quickly uh, happening that nothing can actually be continuously done for a decade, 20 years, 30 years, unless the federal government decides that's what they want. But the populace themselves have no agency. We cannot decide to do something for the next 20 to 30 years. I mean, look at the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Did, 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 did America want to go there? No. America has, has been voting for the anti-war candidate for the last hundred years. The last hundred years. And so number 11, my final point, or I guess 11 plus one, uh, my final point in regards to a criticism and the problems of democracy is that who is allowed to vote? And that's what I brought up earlier. That for, within Athens, it was only free Athenian men, uh, typically that, that uh, had service in the military. In America, they want illegals. You know, and this is where the conversation, and I know it's controversial, and I'm not going to make a, a claim about it because we're on... YouTube, but somebody like our sister Rachel Wilson has highlighted the problems maybe with the 19th Amendment and the suffrage um, movement and, and feminism and how things have been influenced. And we see that that single women vote in a very predictable way compared to married women, single men and married men. Um, from the latest statistics that I've looked at, single men, married men and married women over, overwhelmingly vote Republican. Now, we've already talked about the two-party system as being corrupt and inefficient, and it's really a false form of democracy. But even given that, 
the ideals, and we know that the Republican Party is an opposition party and that they're there to lose and that that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing. They're not going to do anything, right? I mean, Ted Cruz is still going on Fox News complaining about the border and he's been a senator for how long? He's done nothing. He's done nothing. The Republicans are there to lose. But um, you see how married people and single men overwhelmingly want smaller government and more liberty, more freedom. Whereas women and particularly minorities vote overwhelmingly for government expansion, for government safety, as opposed to personal liberty. And the question is then who, who should vote? And now we see that the many people in the country want illegals to vote, which has never, ever, ever, ever been the case within a quote unquote democracy to been something that would be promoted. Because the whole thing is that you have to have a certain group of people that are invested in the long-term interest of the nation state to be the ones that have agency. And of course, that's not it. So uh, those are my 11 major criticisms of democracy and why it's problematic and really why the fact that we in America don't really live in a democracy um, or, or a true republic because we have no agency over the government. And then and we looked at rule of law, mob rule long-term stability, two-party system, influence of media and propaganda, bribery and corruption, free and fair elections, non-democratically controlled institutions like the intelligence agencies, lack of transparency, finished work and term limits, and of course, fair and free elections. I mean, uh, who's able to vote in these quote-unquote fair and free elections? All 11 of these principles we see that in the, in the contemporary American context, they're totally undermined. None of them are supported. And the, all of these are essential to live in a quote unquote democracy. So therefore, do we live in one? I would argue we, we essentially don't. We essentially don't. Um, shout out to David Atlas throws in $10 says excellent stream DPH. God bless brother. Well, thank you so much, David Atlas for your support. Really appreciate that. My man, God bless you. And, uh, Pim throws in another $10. Thank you so much, Pim. He said, after the declaration of emancipation, France went from a monarchy to a de democracy what happened? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, um, you know, we kind of run out of time, but I had an actually an academic, maybe I'll just share it with you guys real quick. I had an academic article and, and I've covered so much of America. I don't even want to go through all these videos. Um, but I had this article here, which was in the Yale journal of law and humanities. And I would say this section right here, um, under, English and French aspects of American constitutional law. This paper is the impact of enlightenment on American constitutional law by Harold Berman. And uh, he makes many interesting points about the French revolution versus the American revolution and, and how different attributes or different emphasis was placed in different ways. Um, so I'll share this link with you guys. If you want to read it, uh, the, the point, as I said, that subsection where um, they talk about French and English, uh, differences, I think was pretty interesting. Um, <laughs> Bill Hicks says, I blame everything on the French revolution. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's the link there. And, um, you know, I had one of these was the difference between democracy and Republic. Uh, we can look at a few of these philosophy. Republics are in opposition to rulership by a single person. Um, all eligible citizens are equal to stay in, uh, say in decisions through elected representatives, unalienable rights, all this different stuff. Uh, definition, a republic is similar to a representative democracy, except that it is a written constitution, yada, yada, yada. So you guys can see all that here. I'll share this link with you guys as well. If you want to check that out, I got to go to my, my niece's birthday. They're 18. They turned 18 on April 18th. I'm, I'm told that this is called their gold, their, their golden day or their golden birthday is when you turn the age of the day that you're born. So I got to go make that right now, but there's that, uh, here's, we looked at this, um, here is an article by the Brookings Institute, um, on liberal democracy that I think is really interesting that talks about how populism is a threat to liberal democracy. I thought that was pretty interesting. Here is a, here's actually a really dumb article. It's by the independent and it's by a British dude literally lamenting a brief history of democracy. Does it still convey the will of the people? And he's still upset. When was this written? Oh, 2018. He's still upset from the two year previously of Brexit. So this whole article is written by somebody who's worried about democracy, not because uh, it doesn't represent the will of the people, but because 
so many people voted for Brexit just by a knife's edge, and therefore it doesn't truly convey uh, the will of the people. So I thought that was a pretty funny little article I read. Uh, and then this one right here gives a little bit of a more uh, structured overview of what Athenian democracy looked like. And we, we saw some of the opening things. I'm not going to show all these other videos like political parties that dominated America. You get it. Federalist papers, um, what the Constitution is. Um, here, this one's interesting. I'll show you this one real quick. This is the evolution of world democracy. We'll end on this one and I'll make sure I read all the super chats. But this shows uh, a government or a, a an overview. Let me let me limit the music here. So. Uh, Abraham Lincoln's inaugurated 1861. So we see democracies in green. So America in, was it Venezuela is the, the only democracies. Then we have colonies, autocracy. So Africa is basically a European colony. Um, and then we have autocracy is in red. And so this is 1878. Here, let me turn this up to two. Uh, American Revolution or the Mexican Revolution here. Now they become a closed uh, anocracy. So we look for green. Green is democracy, right? So the spread of democracy, guys. So you can see here on the bottom graph how it's growing rapidly. So we see uh, the colonies are overturned. Now they're autocracies. Then we have the Cold War. Now we see Soviet Russia, uh, and then, the, the again, the expansion of democracy. Look at South America now. Central America is mostly democratic. Aspects of Africa, obviously all of Europe, even Turkey, Australia, much of Southeast Asia. And now this is 2014, or 2014-2015 is what we're looking at here. And... Yeah. So now it's interesting. Uh, obviously, Brazil is under basically a communist regime at this point, but it's interesting to see how world powers break up because you still have right They're They're claiming uh, um, they're claiming Russia is an open anocracy right now. And anocracy is a hybrid between autocratic autocratic traits and democracy. And um, and you look at who is against who in the world right now. Mm, makes sense. Makes sense. So anyways, guys, that's going to do it for today's stream. Again, a major thank you to Adam. Let me just double check with all the super chats. Uh, last one looks like Kayla Reynolds Raven. Shout out to Kayla Reynolds Raven throws in $10. She says, I've always chosen not to vote and people will tell me then I have no right to complain about government. If I feel I vote, I contribute to the perpetuation of the corruption. Everything you've mentioned here of the current government thoughts. Um, you know, I generally, I agree. Like I, I, I'm obviously concerned on the fair and free elections in this country and whether we even have those or not. And then, um, uh, you know, if we did, I think there'd be some type of reason to vote. Um, you know, it's hard to say there's a real reason. I suspect we're going to have another fake election in, in 2024. So, um, you know, I, we don't control the government anymore. Any, again, if, if you take anything from today's stream, take from it that we in the America, we as a democracy do not have agency over the political institution we live under, which is actually the definition. So even if we did vote, we, we're only sending representatives and we already know all these representatives are phony. So we need a real cultural revolution for even if we're going to go back to the old structure, we need actual representatives that would represent the will of the people, which we don't. So, um, I think there is, um, a lot of corruption, a lot of corruption in our country and I can understand your reasoning. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, Kayla, thank you so much for your $10 super chat. I really appreciate your support and thank you everybody who supported today. God bless you guys. I wish you the absolute best and I hope you enjoy today's stream. Smash that like. And if you want to sponsor a stream, make sure you go to the website and purchase and I will contact you. So as always, until next time, God bless.